So I think one of my highlights, oh, sound pretty loud. I already have a loud voice, so bring me down just a bit. Um, one, of, one of the highlights of the retreat is playing Uno for the first time, meeting a group of ladies from our church. I think I won a couple of times. I think they went easy on me, but um, <laughs> it, was, it was a really amazing time together being with, with a lot of you folks, just being in the presence of the Lord. Um, so appreciate uh, those who went and uh, already looking for next year, looking forward to next year. So, um, so we're officially Flow Vineyard Church. Praise God. Um, I believe the Lord's in it. And, you know, it's just one of those things you got to get used to, right? Uh, it's going to be like, yeah, we're being uh, your time. Uh, flow of your church. It's like when you write checks, you have to make sure you don't write 2022. You got to make sure it's 2023. So it'll get a little bit of use, getting used to, but I'm really looking forward to what God has for us moving forward. And, and uh, I think this year is going to be a good year for, for us. So uh, praise God. All right. Okay. The real Jesus, please stand and come forward, please. Oh, he's not here. <laughs> then how about up there behind me? Oh, are we, do we have the, have the slides up? Technical difficulty. Are we in? Oh no. My computer is not working either. Oh no. Do you see it? All right, that's not real Jesus. So, real Jesus, please show it yourself. No, that's not him either. Where are you, real Jesus? No, that's not him. We're looking for the real Jesus. Man. He's not here, is he? Please, real Jesus, where are you? No. <laughs> We're looking for real Jesus to come. Mm, he's still not here. There he is. There he is. We found the real Jesus right there. Oh, you can't see his face, can you? That's because no one knows what Jesus actually looks like. No one. Because I don't think there's any eyewitnesses here. <laughs> right? Um, so let's talk about the real Jesus. And the reason why this is really important, because the mission for 2023, last year it was praying the impossible. This year is sharing Jesus. Sharing the real Jesus, that is. And that's why it's so important. And when we share the good news about our Lord and Savior, we want to present the real Jesus to the world, not a watered down, not powerless, or too much humanity, not enough deity kind of God. So let me preface today's message by saying this. A book or a movie or a TV series, you yeah, know, that is dramatically or, or you know, immensely popular doesn't necessarily make it thumbs up for us. Why? Because we need to discern. We need to discern. And the reason why this message is going out today is because that, that's, what, that's what it's about. We have to learn to discern. And I may step on little on a few toes today, <laughs> but know that I'm going to 
to share what I what I'm going to share comes from my from my heart, my love for for you as a shepherd, and I have a responsibility also to 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 protect and guide you as well. Okay, so let's pray. God, there's so much uh, social media, movies, music, books out there. God, we need your discernment. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us. Lord, in this vast uh, array of, of things uh, for, for our viewing pleasure, for listening, God, we want to discern what is good and what is not, what is of the Lord and what is not. And so, God, give us that sensitivity, Lord, to, to be able to discern with our eyes, with our heart, with our spirit, with our ears. So that, God, that we would live our lives being a blessing and honoring to you, Lord. So, God, uh, we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today I'm going to talk about, first, a book turned movie. And second, a TV series as two uh, case studies in order for, for us to discern what we should be reading and or watching. First, let's talk about The Shack. How many of you remember the book Shack? It was actually written back in 2007 by a man named Paul Young. His actual full name is William Paul Young, but they just go by, he goes by Paul Young. Um, back in 2007, it sold over 20 million copies. It was top bestseller in both Amazon, uh, a list of bestsellers, and in New York Times. It's a story about a guy, simply a, a guy uh, named Mac, who's had a devastating loss of losing his daughter through, uh, through a murder by a serial killer. Now, this book can be labeled as narrative fiat C. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is a way of trying to, to figure out or to, to reconcile the issue of evil with the nature of God who's supposed to be all good. Okay, and this through a story, narrative, the Odyssey, right? And although it may have, have, have some, helped some folks in their healing process with trauma or abuse, there are way too many theological errors that contradict Christian doctrines that can negate what is helpful. So I'm just gonna go down the list. Uh, in the book, God is called Papa. And God is actually an African woman who seems to want Mac, the, the, the main character, to believe that everyone is already saved. Okay? And that's just the beginning. But we know that to be false, biblically. And there are many other theolo theological issues that, that can muddy the water for non-believers, but also for Christians, because there are number of people, and, and there might be even a movement growing where we want to make God a female. When the scripture is clear, God is always he, the pronoun used is he, and also he is referred to as father, not mother. Also, the God, the Father, and God, the Holy Spirit, never took on a human form. But Papa, God, in the Shack story, says, well, we took on human forms, all three of us. And that's pretty obvious when Matt meets all three of them, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in human form. That's, that is not biblical. Also, God the Father shows the scars of crucifixion on his hands or his, his wrists. Je Jesus died for our sins. He went on the cross. Father did not. The Holy Spirit did not. Jesus, the Son of God, died for our sins. So that's a problem. Besides, uh, God the Father, or Papa, African woman, changes form to an old man. <laughs> okay, which is kind of weird. But Jesus is also portrayed only as a human who can do, uh, who, can, who won't do anything on his own. He can't do anything on his own. He's all human and his divinity is, is completely taken out. But the reality, the truth is he was 100% human, 100% God. The book also 
uh, tells us, according to the shack, that Jesus is the best way and not the only way to have a relationship with Father or the Holy Spirit. And we know to be true that Jesus is the only way. It's not the best way. It's the only way to have a relationship with God. Papa asserts that sin is its own punishment. So there's no real consequences of sin. That's more like promoting karma and not the gospel. The book also talks about how the Trinity submits to each other, which sounds good because, yes, even though God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right, they're all equal in power and authority, and yet Jesus, there's a hierarchy, right? Jesus submits to the Father, Holy Spirit submits to Jesus, but the Father does not submit to Jesus, or Jesus does not submit to the Holy Spirit. So, but the book says that they all submit to each other. There's complete equality, which is not biblical. And it goes on even further to say that the Trinity submits to humans. Whoa. Quote from Jesus in the shack. This is a Jesus from shack, not, not the real Jesus. The Jesus in the shack says, those who love me come from every system that exists. There were Buddhists or Mormons, Baptists or Muslims, Democrats, Republicans, and many who don't vote or are not part of any Sunday morning or religious institutions. You could already tell that he has issues with, with churches, right? I have no desire to make them Christian. Whoa. But I do want to join them in their transformation into sons and daughters of my papa, into my brothers and sisters, my beloved. So he has, he's got something against churches and he's got something against Christians. When Christian, the word, occurs, First, in the Bible, where? In the book of Acts, Church of Antioch. Christian means someone who follows Jesus, right? Who belongs to Jesus. But he has something against Christian, or maybe just the word, okay? So it all sounds good, right? I can get on board with, yeah, we, we become sons and daughters, we become brothers and sisters. Good. But he's saying, oh, no, no. Don't become Christians. Right? When you mix truth with things that are not true, we tend to believe everything. But when, when false, um, even lies are mixed in with truth, then it becomes a distortion of truth. You know, a lot of people say, it's kind of like this. They'll say, well, Jesus is all about relationship, not religion. And I kind of get what, what they're saying. But a lot of times they say it's, it's relationship, it's not religion, just like religion is bad, just forget it. It's all about relationship. And that's okay. But here, listen to James 127 before you, you just dismiss religion altogether. It says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So is religion bad? No. Christianity is relationship and religion. You can't take just one. It's not one or the other. But I, I understand why we say it's relationship and not religion, because people are put off by the word. But as follows the Christ, when we look at scripture, okay, it's both relationship and religion. We later find Paul Young writing a book on universalism. What that it is, what that is, is Everyone goes to heaven. Everyone. That's called heresy. A big no-no. So what's wrong with all, the, all of the above? I mean, the popularity of the book among Christians is quite alarming. Or was. I don't know if it still is. And it could signal a theological shift, which may have, have happened already, where we believe that God is love and God loves us, and that's it. That's the end of the story. We don't bring up holiness of God. We don't bring up repentance of our sin. That's not the gospel when you leave those things out. Yes, it's a fictional book, but has strong theological implications because the, the author, actually, he said he's, he's drawing from his actual conversations with God. So we can't say this is 100% fictional, is it? He's injecting his theology into it. So if you're going to introduce the God, right, in your book, especially Christian God, because 
try on God. Do you know any other religion with try on God? No, this is Christian God. If, it's, if you're going to do that, then you have to be ready to portray the God of the Bible, right? Not a different God of your imagination stemming from your own personal trauma and hurt. I get that he had his own issues, right? He was a missionary kid. He was abused, not by his family, but, but he has a history of abuse in his life. But, he can't, but you cannot create God out of your experience. And we have to realize that the book tries to make God so relatable and so accessible to the broken and hurting world. He does it by lowering the standards of the scripture. He actually mocks the Bible. There's a part where it says, because we couldn't put God in a box, we put him in a book. And so he denies that Bible can actually speak to us. The word of God, he denies that it could actually speak to us. I believe the reason for the popularity of this book is that people are drawn into the emotions of human suffering. But the remedy is not biblical because the writer tries so hard to create a God that conforms to, to our needs. All loving, non-judgmental, everybody goes to heaven kind of God. And after writing the shack, Paul Young actually wrote, Lies We Believe About God. That's the title of the, his, his next book, which is ironic because there's a mixture in his own book of truth and errors. And what he creates is a doctrine of universalism. Again, that's not biblical, where everyone goes to heaven. So it, we, have, we have to be careful, right? And that's just the tip of the iceberg of misinformation that he has put in his book of theology. And it's no wonder the shack actually we see the reflection of what he believes. Okay. But pastor, the book is bringing healing for people. Pastor, the people are talking, start to, to, to have conversations around the water coolers. And non-Christians are reading it. Why make it so, such a big deal? Well, because what I just described is what I call pragmatism. The, the definition of pra pragmatism is whatever works, even if it does not validate the truth. So yes, more people are talking, non-Christians are reading it, but if they're reading the wrong gospel, that's the problem, isn't it? And we're going to talk more about pragmatism later on. By the way, I mean, it's, it's good that people are getting healed emotionally. That's great. But what about their spiritual healing? They're presented in this book with a false Jesus, with the false gospel. Listen, if you want to truly understand God in your suffering, read Job. And it's nothing like the God of, uh, of the shack. Why am I telling you all this? Again, because I want you to learn to discern for yourself, okay, what is good, what is not, what is biblical, and what is not. And by hopefully giving these examples, you can kind of begin to see how you can look at things and be able to judge. Is the Bible not sufficient? Is the Bible not powerful? Is the Bible not comforting? Is the Bible not encouraging? Is the Bible not healing. The Bible is all these things. It's sufficient, it's powerful, it's comforting, it's encouraging, it is healing because of the real Jesus. That's why, you know, what I'm bringing to you today took many hours of research and prayer so that what I present to you is accurate. What I bring out of the Bible is accurate. What I inform you about the shack is accurate. And what I'm about to tell you, the second study, the case study, is accurate. And we're going to talk about The Chosen. An immensely popular TV series that was fully crowdfunded, raising over $40 million. They set a record. I have to say, it is done really well. Okay, Because if anything that Christians make, movies, I think, is cr like cringes you. Because like the, the acting is bad. You know, the, it's just... Bad quality, but this is done well, visually stunning, family friendly for the most part. And I was impressed with this idea of paying forward so that other people can watch it free. 
So I went, watched a few episodes just to see the very first season, but then immediately something didn't feel right. So I stopped watching, didn't think about it much until two years later, I start to think about it again because it's become really, really popular. Okay. So I start to dig a little hole first, which got real big fast. Just like the Shack, I'm going to go down the list of what is wrong about the series because the creator, Dallas Jenkins, okay, he promotes this as presenting an authentic Jesus. He will say this over and over again. I am presenting to the world an authentic Jesus, and he wants to reach a billion people with it. So, so is this the real Jesus? That's the question we got to ask. Okay. I'm going to go through three areas of problems or the issues with the show so you can discern for yourself. Okay. One, the show's association with the Catholics and the Mormons and many other questionable individuals. Two, depiction of other characters in the show. Three, the most importantly, the inaccurate and false depiction of Jesus Christ. So let's first talk about the show's association with the Catholics and the Mormons, as not only there's a, as a priest who consults the show, but the majority of the producers and the, the distributing company are both Mormons. Remember, as even the creator himself stated, he said that this is not a business. Uh, this is not a, uh, a ministry. This is a business, he said. And he owns 44%, while the rest are owned by the Mormons. So he doesn't have the majority. So who do you think actually has a power to dictate the direction of the series? And listen to this. Jenkins, who is supposedly an evangelical Christian like us, okay, declared publicly that the Mormons and we love the same Jesus. That is very troublesome because of what the Mormons actually believe. By the way, they don't want to be called Mormons anymore. Because when you hear Mormons, you think Utah, polygamy, right? <laughs> the associations are not good. Now they're called LDS, Latter-day Saints, or Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. Okay? This is what they believe or don't believe. They don't believe that Bible, Bible is inerrant, complete, or final word of God. Oh, they have their own scripture? Okay. So the Mormons have their own scripture beyond uh, the King James uh, Bible. They have the Book of Mormons written by a new prophet, Joseph Smith. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is straight out of their Bible. Okay. It sounds legit because it even says Second Nephi 31, 19, Morani 6, 4. This is from their scripture. It says, we must work to our limit, then rely upon the merits, mercy, and grace of the Holy One of Israel to see us through the struggles of life and into the life eternal. So we have to do all that we can, then trust God's grace. You know, you know what this is? Work comes first, then grace comes. Not grace alone, but you have to work for your salvation. The Mormons also believe that Jesus is a created being, a God, not the God, and a spirit brother of Lucifer or Satan. And we are all also half or spirit brother of Jesus Christ. They also believe God the Father was just a man, but became exalted. So a man became God. And so we can also become gods and rule over our own planets. By the way, their ad campaign to promote The Chosen um, is called The Chosen is Not Good, but the main character in the ad campaign is the devil. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I don't understand that. But Lucifer, the devil, is the mascot for this show about Jesus. And, and, and the, when you look at these snippets, they make devil look kind of goofy and approachable, like he's a funny guy. Really? 
Anyway, so if we love the same Jesus as the Mormons, and he did clarify later on. Initially, he said, yeah, the Mormons, and we all love the same Jesus. But he kind of walked back. He, took, he clarified by saying, only my close friends who I've spent hundreds of hours with, they believe in the same Jesus as I do. But if his Mormon friends love the real Jesus, either they will no longer be Mormons as they would come out of the Mormon church, which has not happened. They're still, under, uh, they're still Mormons. Only other option is that Jenkins theology is no different than what the Mormons believe. This is the guy making the chosen and notice, and he could uh, correct me if I'm wrong. He has never publicly actually talked about his faith, what he actually believes in. If you see something that outlines what he believes, let me know, but I have not seen it, okay? And yet he wants to reach a billion people. But the question again, is with which Jesus. Oh, and the kicker is this. There's a scene in the first season where even Dallas Jenkins admits that, oh, this could be used as an ad or commercial for the Mormons. And the scene goes like this, which by the way, did not happen in the, in the Bible. This is their imagination that Nicodemus argues that if the Sadducees only accept the first five books, then they're missing out on the rest of the Old Testament which is true, reasonable, but that gives a ground for the Mormons to stand on. Why? Because the Mormon argument now can be that if you only accept the 66 books, which we have, right? 66 books of the Bible, right? Then you're missing out because there's more. There's the Mormon Bible, the Book of Mormons. And you know what? He said it himself that the LDS community and their leadership cheered this scene, as you can imagine. So, yes, now we can promote, if they wanted to, right? The Book of Mormons. Because the rest of Christianity, you guys are missing out because you only have the 66 books. There's also an association with Catholics. Now, we as evangelicals, we agree with Catholics on the sanctity of life, and also the sanctity of marriage between man and woman. Great. But they do not preach the same gospel. They don't. So not as extreme as the Mormons, but still we believe very differently. Because remember when in 1500, I don't remember exactly, when Martin Luther posted the 95 Thesis, right? That brought the Reformation in the church. Okay. There was Council of Trent by the Catholics in response to Martin Luther. And it reads, Council of Trent, sixth session, and they still hold to this. They haven't changed their view. Canon 9, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else required to cooperate in order to bring obtain the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema. I don't know about you, but I didn't know what anathema was. <laughs> I looked it up. It's a curse. So if you think you're saved by grace alone, you're a curse. You got work to do. You're excommunicated by the Pope. Justification, justification by grace and works. That's not the gospel. The Bible states clearly in Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this not is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. So we believe differently, don't we? The show also employs a devout Catholic, Jonathan Rumi, to play Jesus. Someone, <laughs> I was shocked. And he, I think he had it on his Instagram, so it's not, it's not a secret or anything. He communicates to dead St. Padre Pio. He communicates with him, he encourages others to talk to him for, for advice, for guidance. Also promotes a Catholic praying app called Halo, telling people to pray the rosary, which a lot of it, if not most of it, is prayer to Mary. 
which is not biblical because we have Jesus who is our only mediator. There are many other non-biblical Catholic beliefs that we need to consider, such as the Immaculate Conception of Mary. I thought that meant that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. No, that means Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit in order to make sure that Jesus is sinless. But then doesn't that mean Mary's mother had to be also immaculately conceived and her mother and her, it, it didn't make any sense, but they believe that, that Mary was also conceived by the Holy Spirit so that she has no sin, so that Jesus won't have any sin. The purgatory, which is not biblical, praying deceased people into heaven, it's not biblical, veneration of saints, the reality is that we are all called saints. And the infallibility of Pope. And, and lastly, the transubstantiation, which is that they believe that the body and the blood, when they drink the wine and take the bread, that it actually turns into the body of Jesus and blood of Jesus. It doesn't look like it, but it, it turns into as... That's like crucifying Jesus over and over and over again. The point of all this is that, yes, there may be or there are born-again Bible-believing Christians within the Catholic and Mormon church. I'm, I'm not going to say there aren't. I'm sure there is because I know at least of one in the Catholic church. Okay. But they would have left their religion unless called by God to bring change there. And yes, there are Protestant folks who are not born again or Bible-believing Christians because just going to church does not make you a, a believer, right? So there are anomalies everywhere. But the truth of the matter is that what the Mormons and the Catholic as a whole, as entity, corporately teach is not in line with the Bible. The reason why these associations are dangerous is because Dallas Jenkins is influenced by the ideas, the opinions, and the theology of those involved. And I'll give you uh, examples later why that's true. But the Bible says this, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, a lot of times we take that as between man and woman in a marriage situation, right? But this works for other relationships, especially you're, you're in a partnership, in a company, to produce this, this material to go out to billion people, he's unequally yoked, right, with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with uh, Belial, which is really talking about wickedness? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And, and if you do a little bit, just a little bit of research, a lot of the folks involved in the project, including Dallas Jenkins, they have a high regard for a, a Jesuit priest, I, I, I believe, a man named um, Richard Rohr, another universalist who embraces, right, that everyone is saved. And he's got many other cookie ideas about God and salvation. You can look, look him up yourself. What else? Music composed by Christian artist Dan Hasseltine of jars of clay fame, who has deconstructed his Christian faith and now believe that Jesus had many flaws. Him, in collaboration with a new age artist, they're creating music for, for this show. So I mean, think about it, right? If you listen to music or, or, or watch shows that are created by people with questionable background and questionable lifestyle, would you embrace it? Would you embrace their creation? Would you uh, recommend to your children? And, you know, it's, let's say a, a musician, right? Their life, you see it on, on, on TV and, and shows wherever, you know, drugs, sex, right? Promiscuity, abusing wife, all that. And they create good music. So you're going to like, yeah, it's, it's okay. Or you're going to, you know, encourage your children to listen to music created by people with the, that kind of background. I, I personally would not because, because what they believe and how they live their life will lead into their creativity. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that. 
The second problem area deals with the depiction of others in the show, especially the disciples. Now, Peter mockingly calls John the Baptist, and if you've seen the, the show, he calls him over and over, creepy John, creepy John, <laughs> right? Now, creepy John, right? Who's John the Baptist, he is a someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit, even in the womb. How many people can say, I was filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb of, uh, of my mother? He was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Even before he was born, he has the spirit of Elijah. Jesus said, he, there is no greater man than, than John who was born. And he's called Creepy John. Why? Does words matter? I think so. Very much. Words matter. Like when Pastor Steve Furtick calls Jesus sneaky or savage. And the reason is because Jesus came when no one is expecting, so he's sneaky. Can you like picture God being sneaky? Or he was savage because he turned over tables. I, I can't picture Jesus being savage. Remember, the book of James tells us how powerful our tongues are. What else? Peter in the show is seen as a brawler, uh, a, a gambler, and a drunk who, who cheated on, on his wife, none of which are in the Bible. Also, he, he works with the Romans. Um, yeah, a lot of creative additions, right? Other deviations from the Bible. Philip is called, in the Bible, he's called by Jesus to follow him the next day after Peter and Andrew was called. But according to Chosen, it's like weeks or maybe months before Philip is called. So timeline is all messed up. In the Chosen, Nathaniel is a drunk architect. Matthew also was called too early. The Bible says after the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calls Matthew. So, so Matthew is not involved with the Sermon on the Mount at all. Right? But somehow we see Matthew talking to, to Jesus about the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? So it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Jesus can't be talking to Matthew about the Sermon on the Mount when he called him after he spoke the Sermon on the Mount. I think, here's the thing. The chosen child is really hard, really hard to, to portray how bad the disciples are. Okay? Or how bad they were. So we can relate to their shortcomings. Right? And yet, if Jesus loved them as they are, then Jesus loves as we are. But the problem with that is there's no transformation. There's no desire for transformation because I messed up, but Jesus loves me. Okay, that's good. And what about John interviewing? I don't know if you guys noticed. He was going around interviewing and collecting information from like 10 different people to write this, um, right, scripture, right? He was, he was getting information from other people when he was supposed to be, he's an eyewitness to the life and the teachings and the work of Jesus. He doesn't need people to tell him what to write. But Mary Magdalene tells John to leave out some parts. I thought the Holy Spirit was the inspiration. John 21, 24, this is the disciple, talking about John, who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. He did not need people to tell him what to write. The Holy Spirit inspired him because he was eyewitness to Jesus Christ. And the next part, verse 25, the chosen makes it seem like Mary, the mother of Jesus, told John, Hey, put this in, put this in. Now, there are many, also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written. I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So again, it was at, according to the chosen, Jesus' mother suggested that John put this in there. So, um, you see, Dallas Jenkins is doing more than just doing creative edition. He's actually changing what the Bible says. Revelation 22, 
18, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone asks to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. It's pretty serious stuff when you add and take away from the scripture. The issue is this. Dallas Jenkins keeps saying his show is presenting the authentic Jesus. He keeps saying that. If his show is promoted as a primarily fictional work based loosely on the Bible, that will be a different story. But that's not what's going on here. It's not the real Bible. It's not the real Jesus. <laughs> so as I was writing this, putting this together, um, it was like nine pages. Usually I preach like six pages. And I was like, all right, let me try to condense it all into six pages so I could present it all today. And the more I try to condense it, it became more <laughs> to almost 12 pages. So I'm going to unintentionally do what the chosen does, <laughs> right? Cliffhanger. Oh, wait till next week kind of thing. All right. <laughs> to be continued. Okay. But so while you wait for the message next week, where we're going to focus. Okay, on the, the inaccurate depiction of Jesus. That's the third problem area and the most important and the biggest area, right? I want you to pray. You know, I, I'm not telling you, watch it, don't watch it, you know, pray. Discern. You can have conversations. Don't go around, hey, you don't watch Chosen? You should be watching. What's wrong with you? Or you don't watch, hey, don't, don't watch it. It's bad. Don't do that. I, 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 don't, I don't want like the chosen against not chosen, you know, like, right? That's not the point. Have conversations, right? Like adults. And let's talk about it. <laughs> Funny. Like the adults we are. <laughs> okay. And, 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 you know, um, yeah, I, I believe God is teaching us how, how to really, you know, look at things, the things we watch, things we hear, because there's so much sensory overload, right? But we're supposed to think about things that are good, pure, noble. Philippians tells us, right? Praiseworthy. These are things that we're supposed to watch and listen, right? So it's good for us to have discernment with the help of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, yeah. So sit on it, pray on it, meditate on it, have conversations, and come back for the second part, part two of sharing the real Jesus. Let's pray. So God, we thank you that even though there's so much information and and uh, entertainment out there, Lord, because we have the spirit in us, Lord, we're able to discern what is good for us and what is not. And so God, would you help us to be wise? Lord, um, not just with these two, um, the, the shack and the chosen, but Lord, going forward, give us the, the spirit of discernment to know, God, what is helpful, what is what builds us up, what is beneficial for us and for others. God, that, that we're able to, as people of God, discern well Lord, and not be like the rest of the world. And so, Lord, uh, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word and uh, help us to have uh, healthy conversations, Lord, and, and a time of prayer 
where you will speak into our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.